So um, Basil has 25 years experience consulting to primary production um, in areas of farm business, grazing management. He currently consults in a temperate and tropical environments and is a shareholder in a 5,000 cow dairy operation and has 12,000 cows under management for absentee land, uh, shareholders. Uh, Basil consults across dairy, dairy, beef and sheep and has a passion for building capacity amongst his clients and staff. So Basil's gonna wind up our day um, with, a, with a presentation on the interface between animals and plants is where the profitability game is won or lost. And he's gonna provide a little summary of um, today's event. So um, I hope you uh, can hang on for the last little bit of the ride. Okay, uh, thanks very much, Jeff, for the introduction and um, to LLS for the invitation to speak. Um, I think it was Mark this morning, our keynote speaker, who said um, agricultural production systems are some of the most complex and challenging um, to manage, and I think he's absolutely right. Um, you know, when you're trying to deal with people and plants and animals and soils, environment, climate, um, it's incredibly complex. Um, as a farm business consultant, I deal with both primary producers and I have businesses that sit outside there, and I do know that those other businesses are a heck of a lot simpler. They're straight input output, um, whereas, whereas our businesses are a bit like, like herding cats. Um, one of the things that I've noticed, I rarely get invited out to businesses that are humming. There's always issues and we have to try and get these, these things under control. I know if we don't do that quickly that um, eventually they end up biting people <laughs> and they bite them in an incredibly sensitive place. Um, and that's their hip pocket. <laughs> um, 20 odd years ago, we sent 25 years of comparative analysis and skills auditing data across to America to a statistician and asked him basically to tell us where the money was in grazing systems. Uh, and he came back and he said, look, I'm not sure what's going on there, but there's something around animals and plants that gives you about proportionally 70% of the return in the business. And I think, Sue, it wasn't your hand. There's actually a very bad shake in that pointer. 40% <laughs> was in business management. So once you make a return from managing the feed base, it's where you invest it and how you invest it and how you grow the business. 30% is in people management, and obviously the bigger the farm or the bigger the business, the more important that is. But he did say over the 20 to 25 years of data that that had moved in the last five years from 5% to 30%. So it's obviously becoming a more critical issue. And then the operational stuff, the stuff we're all really good at and we get lots and lots of practice at, uh, contributes about 15%. So he explained that by saying, well, if you're going to call yourself a sheep farmer or a beef farmer or a dairy farmer, you better actually be good at the operational tasks. And they're about 20 or 30 bucks an hour. So the business doesn't owe you a lot for that. It's for all the other stuff. The observant people or the an analytical people will notice that it adds up to more than 100%. 100 um, and so we queried that and he basically said, well, you've got something interesting there. He said, your top 10%, which is what we call the best, are really good at most things and everyone else is not so good at anything. So in this su sample, the average here is not the average, it's everyone who's not in the top 10%. And so we're looking at them as two distinct groups of, of individuals. Um, so it pretty much says, you know, in this instance, this is a data set of um, profit and loss converted to um, business profitability and linked back to, to a skills audit for that business in a particular year. And the difference between the top and everyone else was the top was 600% more profitable. So in terms of looking at a business, I, I have a business background, so I look at it in terms of return on capital as being my primary, primary driver. Under that, there's a number of key performance indicators. There's not many of them. That's why they call them key performance indicators. Um, and people will be encouraging you all the time to shift those key performance indicators, despite the fact that you can't do that without an increasing capability a lot of the time. So under the key performance indicator, I see skill development and capability development. 
I also see in a business that's trying to capitalise on, on new research, new techniques and new technologies that we need a fundamental foundation there around the interface between animals and plants. And so down here I think that that is around knowledge and it's around skill and capability and it tends to be stuff that's delivered to you in the adoption space. And if you want to capitalise on the blue area, which is, I see as the bar lifters, the things that every year we can implement in a well-foundationed business to take our businesses forward, to beat diminishing um, terms of trade. So if the foundation's here, we can capitalise on the bar lifters or the new research technologies, techniques. If it's not, the blue bits just become a cost and the business actually goes worse. So I want to talk a little bit about how we often confuse the method um, with the practice. And so a method to me is a tool or a way of doing something and it actually can't be right or wrong. It's just like, do I pick a hammer or do I pick a shovel? It's what I'm trying to do with it that's important. And then secondly, even if I pick the right tool and I can't use it, then I'm not going to do much of a job. So in this instance, we often have this debate around set stocking and rotational grazing, which I think is futile, just like debating spring versus autumn carving or finishing versus backgrounding. It all depends on a whole heap of other things, um, of which one is what you like doing, but more importantly, what you should be doing relative to your fodder flow in most cases. So I see the set stocked as the baseline. That's one way of managing a system and it's fine. I could do some numbers that would give you a return from managing your business that way. I could then invest in all the infrastructure I need to rotationally graze. I could make an assumption about your capability and I could tell you if it was worthwhile or not. What I often see is people who think that moving from set stocking to rotational grazing is just a good idea and so they put fences in and water troughs and laneways and all that sort of stuff. And then I go and talk to them and they say, yes, I'm a, I'm a um, um, rotational grazer. And I say, well, well, what do you base your rotation on? Oh, well, um, you know, um, there's more feed there than there is there, so they need to go over there. Or I started the motorbike and they all started balling, so I moved them over there. So to me, that's like random movement. There's no science behind that. Um, the next step's probably around rainfall. Then you can go to ground cover. Um, time, you can base it on. That's quite common in a lot of areas, particularly in some of the tropical areas. Um, or you can move to morphology. And I think each of those creates a bit more potential, but morphology or how the plant grows definitely creates by far the most potential. And it incorporates some of those other um, measures and it allows us to be very much proactive or to manage the transition between having nothing and too much um, in an in a, a easier fashion than just dealing with uh, a massive feed surplus or a massive feed deficit. Um, the bit we don't talk about much is the implementation or the practice. So any of those systems have to be managed with best management practice. Um, and if we don't choose to do that, um, science and economics will not add up and that creates a massive void and in walks a marketer. And a marketer will take your desire to fill that with some sort of silver bullet and create a recipe and try and sell that to you. And you're a sympathetic target. So we need to have skill to be able to manage these systems. So then what skill? So there'll be no skill development today unless you are outside kicking a football at some stage. But skill is something that's developed over time and it takes a heap of practice and practice generally means pain for people. We want to solve our problems today. So this is not this guy's first day on the job. He's had plenty of practice. He didn't walk down there and say, I'd like to do some labouring. And they said, we'll just chuck 30 bricks on your head and away you go. Um, and he's able to do that now after years of practice and probably losing a few toenails uh, in a wobbly and dynamic environment that looks something similar to ours. So if he can do that, we can manage pastures. So I'm going to talk a bit about rotational grazing and I'm going to talk about basing it on morphology. And the reason for that is I think by doing that, we can easily consume another 50 or 100% um, of feed over and above a set stocking or a randomly um, random movement-based system. Um, I also think there's an opportunity to capture a heap more quality in the feed and to increase the survivability or the perenniality of the pastures as well. So the investment won't be any different, but if we get additional benefits, it's more likely to pay off. And 
we have to invest. We have to invest more in infrastructure, more in time and labour, although it's probably not as much as a lot of people think in terms of moving animals, uh, and in skill development. So what's morphology? Well, it's, it's implemented around leaf stage. So pretty much any plant, any perennial plant, will have a fixed number of leaves that it likes to maintain. So for ryegrass, it might be three leaves. For phalaris, it might be five leaves. And when it puts out its fifth leaf and then starts to put out the sixth, it will kill off the first one. So we need to harvest it before it gets there. So the main thing is this thing called the remnant leaf, which is what was left behind after the last grazing. And everything above that's grown since. So it's pretty simple. As long as you can count to five, you can pretty much do morphology. Um, that's interesting, but what happens under the ground for me is the exciting bit. And in the last four or five years, there's been so much focus on this biology, uh, soil biology and soil carbon and all that sort of stuff, like, but we kind of do everything we can to minimise the amount we're putting in there. So on the right is a ryegrass plant, one leaf, two leaf, three leaf, and on the left is uh, brome, so a four leaf plant. When this plant grows from one leaf through to four, you can see how much additional uh, organic matter it's putting into the soil. Because when it gets grazed, when either of them get grazed, they drop all that off into the soil and go back to that and then reform it again. So in, in a lot of, uh, on a lot of my clients' farms, we like growing probably 14, 15 tonne of dry matter. We're certainly eating that much. We're nearly always eating a, a, a tonne of dry matter per 100 mil of rainfall. So that's a lot of organic matter that we're pumping back into the soils and increasing the capability of the soil. It caps out, so we can't keep going forever. Um, there's the leaf stages for grazing. You can find, you can just Google that and they'll pop up. If you can't, send me an email and I'll send them through to you. Happy to help anyone who wants to try in this space. Um, everyone will have seen this sigmoid growth curve. So if we move through, here we go, recovery phase, rapid growth, and then we tip over. We want to graze plants somewhere up here when we're playing a defensive game like that is we want more of it. If we're trying to curb its enthusiasm um, and it's um, trying to go reproductive or something, we can come down here. We've actually got windows of leaves to graze. We don't have to hit five every time on phalaris and three every time on ryegrass. It's two to three in ryegrass and it's four to five or even three to five in phalaris. So that window's wide. So if I just tell you quickly what's happening in those plants, this is the reason for basing it on morphology. So in phase one, when that's almost complete, we've got some water soluble carbohydrates or just energy starting to be, be stored in that plant, down in the bottom four centimetres of the plant. Um, the roots are actively growing, but there's a real imbalance in the mineral makeup of that plant. It's, it's basically unsuitable for, for uh, animal production. Um, at this stage, those plants are really vulnerable to regrazing because plants use that stored energy to pop a little bit of leaf out, and you'll see it on your lawn when you mow it and it's really gr growing strongly. It pops out a little lime green leaf. Your whole lawn turns lime green overnight. Um, and it has to grow on from that. It's got to capture sunlight from that point on. If you take that off, it's got to try and go again and eventually it'll run out of, of energy and all die. Um, late phase one, early phase two, um, energy reserves are built up enough for the plant to be grazed. So that's useful. If you, you know, we're coming out of a set stocking period for lambing or um, any other reason, then we can get going now. We don't have to wait till everything's ready and then the following day everything's too well cooked. So we can start up early and start pushing a feed wedge forward. Um, roots are actively growing and tillering starts again. So we don't expect very many of our perennials to survive via seed. Mostly we're trying to get them to, to survive via tillering. So we've got tillering occurring here and the mineral balance is coming more into line with what the animals need. End of phase two, which is ideally where we want to graze, um, energy levels fully restored. So this thing will come back hard after grazing. Uh, root growth and tillering are fully, fully active, so we might have three, four, five tillers sometimes per uh, parent tiller, and we've got the maximum amount of feed we can put in the paddock. After that, we start to get death, and then we start to get a drop in utilisation. So just visually again, here's the end of phase two, and all I've done is divide phase two into three equal parts. And with that sigmoid curve, you can see that you grow 50% of the edible feed 
in the last 30% of the grazing rotation. If that was a straight line, you wouldn't need to manage pastures, but it's not. So we can put a bit of effort in and get some output. 50% on 50% is 100% more feed. So that's where I get my 100% from. In terms of quality, so here's our phases down this, the side, 0 to 1, 1 to 1 and a half, 1 and a half to 2. Here's what the animal likes, optimal, along the bottom here. Here's what Gordon was talking about. End of phase one, or one leaf in a ryegrass, probably two in phalaris. We have a potassium to calcium plus magnesium ratio of eight to one. As we go through the phases, we get to 2.5 to, 2 to one, and, and animals like 2.2. So this plant's kind of trying to des design itself to say to the animal, look, if you could just wait till I get through my job, then I'm happy to be grazed. And you can actually graze me as hard as you like, as long as you do it quick and you go away. Uh, and you'll see here twice as much energy at the end. Just while I'm up here, I'll just get rid of a myth that exists in our industry. There's lots of them, but here's a feed test. You may or may not have seen these. We, we do quite a few of them. Um, and here's NDF, neutral detergent fibre, at 43% in this sample. So that means 40% of that feed is fibre and that makes the animal chew and makes them spit and it swallows that and it's alkaline and adjusts the rumen. So it needs to do that and it needs 35 to 45% of the feed to be that. Here's the digestibility, it's 86% digestible. So I shove it in one end at 100% and 14% is going to come out the back end. Now what do I expect that 14% to look like? So in my mind I want it to look like that. My clients get hounded by people telling them to convert that to that by adding fibre. There is no money in firming a turd when they're eating, eating grass. That's the most magnificent quality feed. I'll just go back and show you that it was also 13 megajoules of metabolisable energy per kilo, so same as um, barley or wheat. And the same goes for sheep, so we're out here on this is what we're after, not this. And I think that one was collected at the circus. <laughs> so survival, so even in a 40 year old pasture, each of the tillers probably only roughly a year old. So what you do this year in the, in the tillering phase impacts on what you'll have next year. So overgrazing will decrease those energy reserves um, and plants won't tiller. Uh, and even if they do tiller, we can kill the, the daughter tillers by the overgrazing as well. So if you're grazing for longer than two or three consecutive days, you'll have a 10 to 30% reduction in regrowth. Um, but if you're there for more than five days, you can kill half the tillers and compromise your regrowth by, by 40 to 60%. So that's not good or bad, that's just some facts, and that's what you need to consider in, in terms of whether you set stock or even if you run a rotational grazing system, how, how tight the regime's gonna be. So this is the most common um, problem I see right around the world um, in terms of managing grazing systems, and that is we just don't eat enough of what we can potentially grow. And I actually don't know whether we don't grow it or we grow it and we don't eat it or any combination of those. I just know when I do the back calculation, I'm nearly always disappointed on average. So this is a group I started working with about 15 years ago. And we went through the benchmarking process, you know, all the financials, all the physicals, tried to marry them up, and came up with a pasture utilisation of about 3.7 tonne per hectare. Um, a dairy farmer next door in that environment would probably be eating 10 to 12, so a fair bit of upside. The other thing that I'd never really seen before was of the not very much we were eating, a lot of it was end up maintaining animals rather than going to saleable product. And I think this is actually a function of that. So the animals are hanging around too long. They're not getting enough high quality feed quick enough to get out the gate. And similarly for the reproductive performance on the heifers, same thing happening. Um, so they had an average of 2.4% return on capital in that group. They, they said to me, oh, well, what happens if we improve it? So I would said, oh, well, let's say we could put it up by 20%, the pasture harvested, and we could get this ratio to 60-40. Um, we'd probably do an 8% return on capital which was three times. So they, they thought that was pretty exciting, but I said, it, it actually is very easy to farm on a spreadsheet. So we were lucky enough to get a PDS. 
so we did two farmlet trials on those farms. Those guys went through a pasture management workshop prior to that and gained the skills to implement um, this sort of grazing, grazing regime. Um, they wouldn't let me run any more animals per hectare than they'd run historically. So I think that's a great reflection on confidence level. So they were saying, we don't believe really we can do this. We hope we can and we'll try to, but we want a conservative approach. So any increase in stocking rate here had to come through improved individual animal performance. Um, so we had a guy analyse the results. After about 18 months, we'd managed to get the annual production up from on those two farms, which were above average anyway, from 5.4 to 6, 6.7 tonnes, so about 25 per cent improvement. Um, the amount going to maintenance only went up 5 per cent, um, which was great. We pretty much doubled the amount going to saleable product, and we managed to get that ratio close, but, but not quite there. Improvement in economic performance, so massive increase in saleable product. Their variable costs went up, that was mainly fertiliser. Um, some increase in overheads, that was mainly labour to shift the, shift the animals and a little bit of R&M on more bike movements. Um, but yeah, we tripled, tripled um, profitability. How did they do it? Well, I think everyone would say, oh, if you casually observed, they'd say, oh, well, they went to rotational grazing, but they were already rotationally grazing. Um, so it was all about the practice, nothing to do with the tool. It was just a better way of using the tool. Um, so just some clients of mine. So again, they've been through exactly that same um, process uh, of you know, a partial management workshop and 12 to 18 months of group coaching. Um, so this is Landfall Angus. Um, I don't know if anyone's a seed producer here, but seed, uh, seed stock production's really challenging from a point, uh, pasture management point of view. It's really hard to shift pain. You can't find anyone to give it to. Fortunately, we had a few sheep that we could shift it to. Um, but they've basically gone from a mid-winner stocking rate, which is our critical pinch point, and the higher we can get that, the higher we can load up into our cheap feed point, which is the spring and early summer. Um, they've gone from a, you know, 12 DSE up to 17 DSE, so nearly a 50% increase. You'll note it's over like a 10-year period. So this, it doesn't just happen overnight. Like, it's one thing to be able to do it. It's another thing to get the confidence, confidence to keep throwing more animals at the system. Um, so about 600 registered breeders here, 2,400 registered breeders here. Um, average annual stocking rate from about 18 to 35, so they've nearly doubled it. Um, the reason they went through this process was they went through a succession um, planning exercise and five didn't go into two, so they had to get the business more profitable, so they went down this path. Um, Scott Colvin from Noswick, so 500 mil rainfall sheep. Um, Scott's motivation was he bought the family, family farm at full commercial rate. Um, it was all towable pivots, he wanted to fix all the pivots and it's hard to get land there, so he wants to keep buying more water. So he said, need to get more profitable. So we've been able to go from a mid-winter stocking rate there of nine through to um, about 18. So we've doubled that and average annual from 14 up to 33, so 130% increase. And it's, we've doubled the U numbers. We've maintained the marking percentage and we've traded a lot more lambs there. So from 2000 U's, to 4,200 ewes at 160 per cent, plus trading 6,000 lambs. Uh, Chris McQueen, or Macca, he's about my favourite client. Um, he's pretty open about everything. He, his motivation is he has a surfing addiction, and he said, farming's the only, beef farming's the only thing that gives me the flexibility to go to the beach whenever I need to, and to get overseas to all the great surfing venues whenever I get the urge. So he's highly motivated, he's more motivated than anyone. Um, and as a result, it was all about profit for him. So he's had big increases in midwinter stocking rate and average annual, but his profit's gone up 10 times. So he's had a fair old boost in here from, from beef price, but the land price on Flinders Island would have gone up two and a half times in that same period. So he's still going forward and you can see that through the, through the physical side of the business. So just some key messages out of today, and the, the black ones are kind of the deliverers take kind of mine, and then the red one is just something I got out of it. So from Mark this morning, um, you know, our businesses are complex. I, I absolutely agree with that. Um, 
and we want to work with good people and, and innovators, and some of those innovators will be on the cutting edge and some will be on the bleeding edge. They, they all contribute highly to, to taking our industries forward. Um, for me, there was an issue in there around we, we do spend a lot of time talking about maximising. I think a lot of the time we mean optimise, but we actually say maximise. But the focus is when you've got that many variables, a leaky system and a dynamic environment, that it has to be an optimising um, effort. Um, Richard, I'm loosened. So for me, um, can, these companions will decrease density, but they increase this um, plant available water, and plant available water must drive production. So that, that was something for me that was right in my face. And the other one was there's no use establishing plants over and above what you can maintain. And I think we saw in other presentations how expensive establishment is. So you know, we need to work that back. And we, we, there's probably another message in there that, that says we, we always over allocate in that space. We always plant more seed than we need just in case. Um, for me, we, we're always trying to drift loosen out of our irrigated systems um, in South Africa onto dry land. Some places it works, some it doesn't. We've always assumed it was water. I think now it's probably temperature. Um, Jason, so the, the issues here around um, soil acidity, and, and he was not apologetic at all in terms of we're re reviewing some stuff here, but a really great message there about being proactive and not waiting till you get a, a production lag or a production compromise or a poor soil test to do something you know you should already be doing. Um, that issue of getting it above 5.5 to get it to move down, for me, I, I've been telling my clients for, I don't know, 25 years, just goes down the profile at an inch a year. So if you're cultivating, take the opportunity to get it at depth quickly. So it was kind of right, but not, not very right. So, so for me, at least I can provide a bit, bit better advice. Um, don't pay for things you, you won't use or you don't use. I see lots of that. So you know, if, you, if you're getting a soil test done, you want to look at pH and else and P, then just pay for that, 40 or 50 bucks, not 150 bucks. Um, beware of the urban myths. I talked about that. Um, I think our, our industry is full of them. Um, first, a misinterpretation, a, an easy sell on the message, and then a Chinese whisper. And that one about the eight tonnes versus the 5.5, I mean, I've fallen victim to it somewhere along, along the way. Um, it's, it's not offensive for you guys as producers to ask us to justify what we're saying. It's time consuming, and we, you know, we've got big egos, we don't like it, but we will go and find the answer. Um, Lisa and Beck's work. Um, so that issue around pastures aren't cheap to establish, and if we've got a major limitation, then we need to overcome that. So understanding that pH profile is really critical. Um, smarter farming has got 200 bucks a hectare to establish perennials. I mean, you'd be swamped in Tasmania if you put that up there. Um, you could probably go to one farmer and get rid of it all, I reckon. Um, it did occur to me that there's always a heap more money in fixing a fundamental issue, something in that foundation I talked about, than there ever is operating at the margin. So I think come back, coming back annually or biannually or whatever and making sure you got the, business, the basics right is, is actually critical. Um, Mike's presentation, I, I loved it. So I loved the fact that we weren't, stuff wasn't rammed down our neck, it was kind of take it or leave it. Subclaver's working for you, then carry on. Don't change over just because I think it's a good idea. Look for these bomb-proof op options that fit the system. Like I love low-risk or lower-risk farming systems. I, in my dairy business, um, it's, it's one of our mottos, is that we will actively trade profit in better than average years to survive or trade against risk in those, those years that will wipe you out. Love this bit of weed thing. Look for something with a bit of weed. That's code for it'll persist. It hangs around. It likes the environment. It's well adapted and it won't cost much. Um, and, and the other one is that sheep look better with the ears. I think you might have said that yesterday. Um, Gordon, yeah, I, I, I like this talk because it was so succinct. and. It had a definitive answer. It wasn't like, oh, well, we did this, and so we've got this answer, but that only appe appeals to this scenario, and under 14 different options, we get a different answer. It was pretty much, 
we tested something, it didn't work, go back and have a look at the solution that we all knew about for the last 10 years when we walked in here and let's see if we can make that better. Um, so, so the tropical grasses. Um, so I, I spend quite a bit of um, time in the tropics and subtropics. Um, and I describe tropicals as temperates on steroids. So when we're running that morphological system of management, we are down on 10 day rotations at times on those tropicals to keep a lid on them. The quickest we'll ever get on a temperate is probably 18 days. So big difference there. Um, I thought the issue around um, water use efficiency, summer rain, and that becoming more of a proportion of the total rainfall uh, meant that it was you know, a critical um, issue here. And I also thought the fact that over the last two, year, two days, it appears that there's not that many perennial options here. So anything's got to be better than nothing. And these things do survive, and when they get rain, they do go like the clappers. So this is an article I pulled out of the newspaper 10 years ago, I reckon, um, when I was at home at mum and dad's for Christmas and had a bit of time to read the paper. And basically it says, waste of millions, any golfers in the room? Each year, Australian golfers spend $300 million to upgrade their equipment. And I reckon 99% of them have got a perfectly good set of clubs already, but that's the amount of money spent upgrading each year. But over the last 10 years, the average handicap's gone up, which I don't play golf, but I do know that means you're getting worse. So all I can conclude is they're hitting the ball further in the wrong direction. <laughs> that the broader community is no different to us. We always assume our skills are higher than they actually are, but it does mean that we can't capitalise on the better club. So my challenge is to get your business into a position where you can capture the benefits from these research updates. So thanks. Thank you.